Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ann Wallhout, Association Coordinator with EMA. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar using BASF LaTeX and microsurfacing applications. We do have you all on mute for today's webinar and we'll be using the question function on the right hand side of your screen for any questions. We do recommend using your computer audio for today's webinar. We want to thank, thank BASF for sponsoring today's webinar and we'll now pass it over to Antonia, Antonia Chan to introduce today's speakers. Hello, welcome to the webinar today sponsored by BASF. Um, BASF is a proud member of both EMA and ISSA and we're excited to use this virtual platform to continue our work in sharing best practices and state-of-the-art knowledge in latex polymers with this pavement preservation industry. I'm really happy to introduce today's speaker and my colleague Arliss Cadmus, who will be spending the next 40 minutes presenting our webinar today, which is titled Using BASF Latex in Microsurfacing Applications. Uh, Arliss is a senior technical specialist uh, here at BASF and for the past 12 years. He is currently a member of many different professional organizations, including EMA, ISSA, and the Asphalt Institute. Prior to BASF, Arliss worked for the asphalt industry for 22 years. His experience includes formulating asphalt, modified asphalt, asphalt emulsion products. He's also worked developing products and specifications for systems that use asphalt and asphalt emulsions in a wide range of field applications. He's a chemical engineering graduate and resides in Wichita, Kansas with his wife, Crystal, and his uh, children, Isaiah and Isabella. Arliss, thank you and looking forward to hearing from you. Please take it from here. All right, thanks, Antonia. I really appreciate the introduction and appreciate this opportunity. Uh, Anne and Ellie, I uh, appreciate uh, you guys setting this up and all the help that you've given uh, to make this presentation possible. And <clears throat> just want to thank all the attendees that have signed up. And as mentioned, you know, I'll be available after the presentation's over to answer the questions that you may have in the chat. Um, would be much appreciated for all the questions that you may have. For today, what I'd like to do is just kind of go over and introduce our BASF latex dispersions. And I'm going to get very specific on the dispersions that are used in microsurfacing applications. Uh, they're typically latex modified emulsion applications and just kind of go through how these latexes are handled, um, how you'd handle them in the plant, some of the things on storage, and then get a little more specific on actually using the latex in uh, production, kind of how the soap, the process of the soap is usually made and uh, the emulsion manufacture and then go into kind of how they're, what they're used as far as performance and go through some of the tests that identify the polymer and why it performs well, uh, as well as uh, uh, ending the presentation on some of the mixture testing that uh, and how the polymer improves performance and kind of what goes into that. So with that, uh, going through the agenda, I I'd like to also start out by showing you um, kind of a little bit what BASF is about and what our plant uh, that supplies the latex, kind of where it's at and kind of uh, a little picture of what the plant is. This is our plant, uh, plant one, we call it uh, our Amnicola plant in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And the river you see in the background, it's a really a nice location along the Tennessee River. Um, if you get a chance and you're in the area, uh, the Plant folks just uh, would kind of like, as long as you'd give them some time to possibly give you a tour or whatever of, of the plant. Uh, with all the things going on with COVID now, a lot of that stuff has kind of been stopped, but hopefully in the near future, like I said, if you're in the area, um, you know, that's, that's something that the guys uh, at the plant will really like to do. There's a, a couple other things at the plant that I want to bring up. The plant this year celebrated an anniversary. And I'm not going to tell you what that anniversary is because we've got a, a question coming up that will let, allow you guys to guess, but that's just a little bit of a tease to just think about how long this plant may have been in operation. 
are products that we, BASF, supplies into the asphalt and asphalt emulsion applications are butanol NX4190, butanol NX1129, butanol NS175, butanol NS198, and acronol NX4627. The butanol NX1129 and 175 are anionic products. So the two that are used since microsurfacing are cationic asphalt emulsions are butanol NX4190 and butanol NS198. Uh, the majority of uh, manufacturers will use 4190 uh, because it helps out in some of the residual uh, testing parameters that need to be met for the microsurfacing products. But butanol NS198 is also used based on some asphalts. Um, it can be used as well. So now I, I asked you about um, the plant and things. I just want to start this off with folks and just uh, here's a poll question. How many years has BASF's Plant One in Chattanooga, Tennessee, been supporting the asphalt industry? I mentioned that it's had uh, a 50, uh, 20, 25, 50, 75 years. So I think um, Ann and Ellie have the poll open and we'll give you a, a little bit of time to decide on how many years. I'll narrate this a little bit for you. Um, we've got a few more seconds left in the poll. Our list is looking like um, there might be some people that, that uh, I don't know, randomly guessing. We've got most of the, <laughs> most of the votes are, are for the correct ones. We've got 11% that are guessing 25 years. No one's guessed 20 because uh, because we've been around quite a while, right? Good guess. 14% uh, are guests in 75 years, but about 75% of the uh, of of those contributing to the poll are guessing 50 years. What say you? I say that the 50-year people are are doing very well. I mean, it's a obviously this is kind of a question that's not about the really the microsurfacing and whatever, but our plant was very very uh, excited and. Brittany at the plant shared a, a lot of great pictures uh, and to be around for 50 years and all of those 50 years, it hasn't been a BASF plant, but um, it has been supporting the industry, that plant. And obviously it, the plant doesn't look the same as it did 50 years ago. There've been a lot of upgrades and they've done a great job um, doing that. But yeah, I, we wanted to put this out there because the plant was very excited and we just wanted to let you know that BASF's been around for a while and you know we plan to be around for a while, quite a while longer and uh, we'll keep improving that plan. So thanks for those who answered the poll question. We just thought it'd be something fun to start this off. So what, what I want to do now is um, just give you guys a few pictures of some microsurfacing applications and kind of what microsurfacing is about. Um, just before we get into some residual tests, I know Many of you who are attending this may understand and know what microsurfacing is, uh, but to get a few pictures and things are, are pretty important. A, a lot of the benefits I'm going to start out with, you can see the pictures on the right, but just most like most pavement preservation treatments, we want to try to renew some of that aging surface. Basically, let the driving public drive on something that looks really nice, gets improves the skid resistance, but Basically, what we're doing is we're kind of getting a waterproof layer on the surface, and it's being used in all over the country, whether it's in northern climates that have some snow piles that can handle that. Um, microsurfacing, unlike chip seal, can repair rutted pavements. And that was one of the things, obviously, with the incorporation of the super paved binder specifications, there have been fewer and fewer rutted pavements. But honestly, that's what microsurfacing was first developed to do. But as I mentioned, it also improves skid resistant greatly and helps reinforce the, the pavement overall, especially if you're doing some rut filling because some of those ruts can be pretty deep that I've seen filled with microsurfacing. So we'll get into a couple of more pictures here. You can see the mix in the box as it goes down. And I want to put this on there because normally you have about 91 to 93% of microsurfacing is obviously the aggregate. And the residual asphalt, uh, the asphalt emulsion will be around 13% usually, but when you're looking at the percent at actual asphalt in it, that's where that seven to 9% comes from. So with the emulsion itself, 
Usually the residual content's about 60%, a lot of water. But with our butanol polymer, it's usually in there. Microsurfacing specs have a minimum of 3%, but normally you're looking at three and a half to three and three quarters percent to meet a lot of the residual requirements. Some of them can go to four and slightly above that depending on the asphalt that you use. And this is a little higher polymer content than chip seals, but um, it's necessary due to the process and the microsurfacing. The emulsifier loading are, are, is higher than what you'd see in chip seal as well. The specific type of emulsifiers that are used, they're very good emulsifiers that the suppliers have. And those are in the range of one to 2%. Usually you're looking 1.2 to 1.4 are the average percentages. The technology in getting this mixed down is, and you'll see on a few pictures later, that this is machine mixed with a graded aggregate. So asphalt emulsion goes in along with some, usually some water and some additives, whether it's some fine cement to trigger the reaction or some additives even to slow down the mix at times in warmer climates. Uh, the machine then applies this microsurfacing as a slurry to the road surface. And the key to microsurfacing is that it cures in traffic in one hour or less time. And this is very important in some of the pictures that I'll show you. Um, I wanted to start out some of the general pictures with basically the stockpile picture. You'll notice that this is going into kind of a screening plant. And with what you'll see in the pictures, it's very important here that if there are any oversized aggregates that they get out of the microsurfacing mix because with the way that microsurfacing is laid down, it may cause some drag marks in the surface. So that's why I wanted to get this picture in here because you might see this if you go to a pro project and you're going, gosh, why are they doing that? Why not, aren't they just dumping the aggregate into a truck? Because they're really wanting to make sure. Because this texture that I'm showing you in this slide it is very important. You'll see the quarter on there and just the nice surface texture that this fresh microsurfacing mat. The picture below, was a mat that was just placed. You'll notice that it's brown and the mat in just about the little bit of the top left hand, you'll notice it's a, a much blacker in color. And that was put down probably an hour before or maybe even a little bit longer. And they've just come by and that brown mat will turn that black color. And if you look at the picture of the uh, mat being placed, you'll see the mix going into the box and there's actually a secondary strike off. And if you notice, that there's a texture difference and the secondary strike off has been used probably for the last 20 years and it was a significant development to help improve texture on the surface. So that's something you may see too. Here's an example of a continuous machine and because this mix can cure very fairly quickly, um, the machine can place down and if you're in an area or a highway or an interstate where this material can be applied, um, it can go down without the machine being stopped. And they call it continuous because you have this truck in the front that's called a nurse truck, and it can haul the aggregate emulsion and water. And the water and emulsion hose will be hooked as it backs in. The machine that's applying it never stops, and the product can just be placed um, in a continuous manner without having to be stopped as long as you have enough nurse trucks feed it as it's moving down the road. So this is a, a very good. Um, process, especially for highways and interstates. And one point I'll make is nighttime applications are very good for microsurfacing. I do not have pictures of nighttime application because I've tried taking some and, you know, the pictures don't turn out real well. They get a little blurry, but um, the chemical break of microsurfacing creates a, a great application for nighttime. This next slide shows the difference between a surface application and a rut fill application. The one on the left, they're using a burlap drag rather than the secondary strike off. There's some folks that still use those because of the texture that they want. The picture on the right shows the, a rut box in place where it's filling each wheel rut of the pavement in two separate passes. You notice the pass on the right, again, is much blacker in color and it looks uh, very good. The pass on the left, is a little brown, and again, that will turn fairly black. Usually in rut filling applications, you'll see these two, and they'll actually put a surface over these rut fill applications um, as well. But sometimes, you know, they just leave the two rut fill applications, but that's, that's not very often. 
but that's an important process too in microservicing. So it's a, a, a great process that gives you a lot of options for uh, servicing your road. It can be used on highways. This is a beautiful section of microsurfacing on a highway road in New Mexico. It looks very good. Here's some city streets that are being done. It can be used on there very well as well. And overall, in, in all the projects that are done, you know, kind of where does the polymer come in and what benefits do you see with using polymers? And overall, just like any pavement preservation app, application, we want to improve the overall performance and durability of the road. And I've got a couple slides later which kind of show you how that happens with the residual properties as well as some of the uh, mixed design parameters that are done for microsurfacing. But you also want to give the user uh, a great preventive maintenance application that helps to increase the life cycle of the pavement and kind of reduce the cost that they won't have to go out there as often to, to put down the product. It's also very cost effective versus like a mill and fill hot mix application. And uh, whether it's microsurfacing does a very good job and actually a chip seal also does a very good job as a cost effective application to a mill and fill in some processes. And if you, after this, if you wanna to go to our BASF website, um, you will be able to find some uh, papers that have been done on eco-efficiency studies that show microsurfacing and chip seal and a couple other processes that actually show the benefits of doing that. So that's uh, an important uh, kind of tool to have in your toolbox as well. So we want to now get into how the arbutinol product gets into the emulsion products and kind of uh, what it looks like and kind of why you would want to use it in the processes. So first of all, there, there's a lot of different polymer choices that you can have in making asphalt emulsion. There are some different latexes. The, the pictures that you'll see on the top is our SBRBS at butanol. The top left picture is actually a picture of the latex product. The picture on the right is actually a dried film of this latex. And some folks like to pour that down, dry it in a low temperature oven so they can kind of flex it and see what it looks like. There are other latexes that are used in all asphalt emulsion manufacturers such as neoprene, natural latexes, acrylics. Natural latex is one other product that has been used in the past in microsurfacing uh, as well. But to go on to the dry polymers, SBS, EVA, you can see pictures of both of those in the um, bottom left and bottom right. Around GTR, uh, not much uh, used in, in very many emulsion products. It's used in some, but um, there are some microsurfacing products now that have used some SBS. And we'll go into kind of whether it's a, a modified asphalt versus latex modified emulsion and some of the differences there. But our BASF Unol product works extremely well in microsurfacing and performs very well to in the microsurfacing product. So I want to get into now um, before we show some of the manufacturing parts is just kind of how you store latex and kind of move the latex around in a plant, kind of what are some of the best practices. First of all, um, at our BASF plant, we use stainless steel tanks. Uh, some fiberglass reinforced polyester have not been used very often, but I do want to point out that they're used for a specific purpose. For asphalt emulsion plants, carbon steel tanks can be used and they can be either lined or unlined, but some of the issues there were slightly um, cationic in pH and with the acid they you will discolor a little bit the latex. And we have other products that we sell our latex into from our Chattanooga plant. So we use our stainless tanks because they won't discolor the latex. But for asphalt emulsion applications, um, you know, the stainless steel typically isn't used in a plant because almost all tanks are carbon steel and they want to mix and match. And that is not an issue with using our latex. Now, moving the latex from point A to point B is another question that is often grabbed by, uh, asked by some of our customers. If you're just moving it from a truck to a tank or a, from one tank to another, air diaphragm pumps are, are very good. 
the whole idea behind pumping and moving latex is you want pumps that don't have a lot of shear. And you'll notice these pumps don't. If you shear the latex, it is a dispersion similar to an asphalt emulsion, uh, which is a dispersion. So actually when you add the latex asphalt emulsion, you'll see later it's kind of a coal emulsion. So you wanna kind of treat them the same. So an air diaphragm pump works great if you're moving latex from point A to point B. If you want to meter the latex in some applications, use a progressive cavity pump. They don't have a lot of friction to the latex and they are very accurate. Some of the models are Netsch, uh, Moino, CPEX pumps, but they work extremely well uh, if you're trying to meter latex. Now, the metering of the latex itself, we do not recommend any meters that would have any veins or moving parts in the meters. Uh, at BASF, we use a lot of micromotion, uh, kind of Coriolis mass flow meters a lot. Mag meters or mass flow meters are the ones that are recommended. And latex works very well in those types of meters. Again, they're expensive, but um, I'll tell you, if you have a vein meter, they do not, they won't stay accurate for long because the latex will bind up and you'll be replacing them. And these meters work very well for a long period of time and they're well worth the investment in them for moving latex. Now, the production itself and the using of the latex and making asphalt emulsion, I'm going through some production steps here that uh, usually there's, uh, this is kind of the best practice that we're looking at. We typically add the water to the correct temperature based on the emulsifier to be used for production. So you wanna get with your emulsifier uh, manufacturer and they have a good idea. So basically you're putting the water in at that temperature. You're adding a little acid to the water and then usually add the emulsifier to react uh, in that acid. The emulsifier is mixed around, you check the pH, and then you add the latex to the solution. And you, again, you wanna check the solution pH after that because for those of you who've done microsurfacing designs, the pH on the solution and ultimately the emulsion is very important in how that product will get that one hour uh, traffic time out on the road. You get it to mix, break, and cure at the right time. And so you wanna check the pH again after you add the latex. I wanna emphasize that because of the latex and the solution should be run within a few hours of production. We do not recommend making the solution the night before and then running it the next day. Um, it should be run fairly quickly. One point I'll make is that latex can be injected into the solution in a microsurfacing when you're making microsurfacing, but you want to make sure, that, again, the pH is very, very important to be able to measure. So you want to have some way of measuring that solution pH after the latex injected into the solution on the way to the mill. That is a good process and it can be done. One process that cannot be done is injecting the latex into the asphalt line right before the mill uh, in making microsurfacing. That is not a process that should be done um, in making a microsurfacing emulsion. So overall, I had um, talked a little bit earlier about the different polymers and things, and uh, I want to start out with, you know, why are you wanting a latex in asphalt emulsion versus running a modified asphalt? In making them and I want to give you a few differences in the products and basically if you have an SBS or an EVA uh, modified asphalt that you're making emulsion usually those will be run at a little higher asphalt temperature and so the emulsion temperature will have to be a little higher sometimes you have a uh, the exit temperature will be above 100 degrees C you actually have to have a heat exchanger to cool that down so it won't boil and things uh, coming out of the mill. Uh, some folks uh, in microsurfacing emulsion, typically a lot of plants actually will have heat exchangers for both of these processes because you usually want to have the emulsion out to the contractor at around 120 Fahrenheit, which is about 50 degrees C um, in those applications. The cooler emulsion helps in their mix break and cure time. So again, uh, heat exchangers are, are used anyway in both the applications. But the idea behind this, and there'll be a couple pictures later, is that the polymers, when you get the asphalt droplets and making the emulsion, the polymer is actually part of the asphalt droplet in this. But when you use our latex in production, it is basically a co-emulsion. 
And what you're looking at is, again, the latex is part of the soap solution. When you make the emulsion, it is co-milled, which means if you look at the picture on the right, it's kind of a picture of the asphalt droplets, which are fairly large compared to the latex droplets. And the latex droplets are separate themselves. And there'll be a, a couple of slides later, which I'll show you in basically how this coalesces and forms, and actually a picture of a mixture that kind of proves this concept of, of this latex film. But the benefits of running the solution is uh, you can run the latex as part of the solution. You have a lower viscosity. You're basically not having to heat the asphalt as hot. You don't have a special mill to make the emulsion. Handling the emulsion it is fairly easy. So the polymer, again, is in the water phase. And so you can get a continuous film around coating and curing. Here's a picture that gives an example of that, how the asphalt coalesces. The picture on the left is neat asphalt. So you just have asphalt without any polymer. The picture in the middle is latex modified emulsion. Those latex droplets will cure and break, and you'll see them form kind of a, a kind of a film around the asphalt droplet. And, and this is very uh, important when we look at it. But when, if you have a polymer modified asphalt, those droplets have to coalesce and blend together as themselves. And the soft points and things the, that that polymer creates, it can make it a lot more difficult to get good cohesion results in microsurfacing in cooler temperatures with running a modified asphalt uh, as in a microsurfacing versus using a latex modified emulsion. But both of them polymers, you improve the binder properties and um, you know the properties that you want to see in the residual requirements, whether you're using a um, SBR or, or another polymer modified asphalt. Here's just a, a picture of an example of this latex and how it forms a film formation again on the, the product itself and the film around it. Again, I've got a, a good picture that I'll show you a little bit that will kind of really identify this from an actual mix in the field. From a particle size standpoint, what we want to look at is in, in this product, you'll notice the particle size graph on the screen that came from our, our laboratory in Charlotte. And what I want you to notice is I told you that latex is uh, a little smaller in particle size. You'll see this little latex bump on the bottom left. Normally, uh, particle size of a emulsion without latex would be a simple normal curve. But that left leg, because of the smaller particle size, you'll see that little latex bump. So if you're a lab that runs particle size, you can actually sometimes identify that, uh, the latex in there with that little bump. So now I want to get into some of the properties of the butanol latex and asphalt emulsion. Uh, I want to get into some of these materials. But before I start with some of those, I've got another poll question that I'd like to ask. It says, in your opinion, which microsurfacing residual tests are the most difficult to perform? Softening point, last recovery, forced ductility, or another? So the poll's open now. And just obviously, there's no right answer to this one. So just go for it. and. Uh, We'll see what you respond to. Arliss, thanks for the presentation so far. So we've got um, we've got about fifty percent of the ballots being cast. Uh, not to try to lead, but um, <laughs> Arliss, maybe just quickly, you know, what what in your opinion do you find? You know, I know that you may not have done these residual tests recently, but uh, your your memories when you were learning how to do these? <laughs> well, I, I will give a general answer and then we'll see some pictures later. But if those of you who have done um, high temperature recoveries, whether it's a distillation, most of the microsurgeon distillation, you'll notice that the residue is kind of a black cottage cheese. So it's not easy to pour. So we'll see what mm -hmm. the what the results are. What have they come up with, Antonia? So. So if if you don't agree to any three of these, if they, you think there's a different test, remember to share your response in the chat. Um, but we have 15% of the of the attendees saying that its softening point is the most difficult. 24% okay. are saying elastic recovery, and then 61% the majority are saying that it's forced ductility that's the most difficult to perform. Okay. And then share your thoughts in the chat if you if you disagree. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's it's kind of interesting because forced ductility is not a test that's normally associated with microsurfacing, but yeah, I really haven't seen a spec with that. Most microsurfacings have a softening point test, and uh, some now are starting to use some elastic recovery. So very interesting answers, and um, we'll we'll go through some of that. But before I start into some of the residual tests, I just want to show you um, our lab in, in Charlotte. And you'll notice uh, Bill Kirk, who's our technical specialist, he does a great job keeping the lab running and doing some of the testing there uh, on the products. And uh, you'll see in a little video a little later, a couple of the uh, testing actually being done and, and you'll see some of those properties that, that Bill has. And there's one kind of process in particular that Bill came up with that I wanna introduce to the folks. So again, for the residual asphalts and some of the testing, what I wanted to show is most of the specifications now have a distillation. Usually it's 350 Fahrenheit, which is 177C distillation. And uh, we got a video kind of what that looks like. And I mentioned that this is kind of a black cottage cheese looking residue, which you'll see, I'll comment on that later. But what really the material looks like in the field is, is a film. It doesn't quite look like that. And so we want to see something like a low temperature recovery procedure start to be used a little more and some testing done on those because uh, I think it will be more indicative of the performance of the residue. So I wanted to add that slide on the right just to show that people are looking at properties from say a 60 C or 140 degree Fahrenheit recovery method, which is kind of the top end of kind of what the field temperatures are. So now I'd, I'd like to show you a video of the still. And so here we go. After performing distillation, high viscosity asphalt residue is poured from the still into this asphalt tin. Use a spatula to help quickly remove asphalt residue while maintaining high temperatures for samples to be tested. Okay, guys, um, hopefully you saw that. And what we wanted to show with that are that kind of that black cottage cheese and how that residue, it's not really coming out of there. It, it would be difficult to pour, just kind of why we asked the poll question about the, the applications. And now I wanted to show you a video of kind of a something that would make it a little easier, something Bill came up with in the lab that will kind of give you an, a little better idea on how to actually utilize that material out of the still. So with that, here's another little video. To perform the softening point test, high viscosity asphalt residue is placed into these small softening point molds. Use a syringe to easily and safely fill the mold, making sure asphalt residue touches all sides of the mold. Asphalt residue overflowing the mold will prevent the mold from properly seating in the sample fixture in the softening point instrument. Okay, guys, um, that process of the video to kind of show how to use that, that's, if you tried to pour that thick residue for those of us who have done that, it can be very difficult to pour like a softening point or an elastic recovery when you have a high, high polymer modified material like a microsurfacing 
is. And so using that syringe is one of the things that was very cool when I saw it and, and it works extremely well. And it's something that you guys might wanna take a look at in using. And these videos um, will be up on our BSF site in the near future. And you can just email me and we might be able to get you copies of them as well. But we wanted to kind of show you that. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way uh, and an easier way of dealing with that residue. And again, that black cottage cheese kind of looking residue is, is not normally what you see. I don't think anybody's ever seen that out in the field. Um, but unfortunately, with the high temperature recovery method, that's kind of what you get. So I want to go into now some of the residual tests that are um, done and kind of what the polymer effects on some of these are. Elastic recovery, force ductility, toughness, tenacity, torsion recovery, softening point. I'm going to focus on two of them that are kind of specific to microsurfacing, and that's softening point and elastic recovery. I'm going to hit uh, first, though, we have designed our products, and I mentioned Butanol NX4190 was kind of designed to help some of these residual tests and to make the performance in some of these testing processes better. 198 can also be used with some asphalts that um, would you'd be able to get the performance out of it as well. But we've designed our polymers to help meet some of these requirements. So here's the elastic recovery test and basically um, fairly simple test. It gets pulled out 20 centimeters, made it a certain amount of time, it gets cut at, by the way, at about 10 degrees C. And then you'll notice that the unmodified binder up on the top, it does not recover very much but the modified binder does. Usually the specifications and agencies is around 55 to 60% recovery. And you'll also notice that the thickness of the elastic recovery uh, sample on the bottom is a much thicker band, which it just kind of makes it more of a rubber band like, and it just pulls itself back. And you'll notice that when you have a, a good polymer modification, you'll see that. The other test is softening point, and this kind of a little picture. We have a picture of ours in the lab. We have an automatic softening point tester that we use. Um, some people call this, it's not a very good stress strain measurement to it. You have the steel ball on it. You heat up the water. Um, usually, uh, there can be other things if your softening point is high, but usually water. And the steel ball, you measure when it drops down and touches the bottom uh, with the asphalt sample. And so it's a kind of a unique test to run, but it is run on a lot of microsurfacing applications. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to show you a, a video clip of, of that as well. One thing I wanted to mention that the dynamic shearometer, there have been a couple of agencies that have specced DSR measurements on some microsurfacing residue. And those, um, I think you'll start seeing a little more and more the DSR being used. I think when we really want to identify though, a lot of performance related aspects to microsurfacing and not just use a DSR as an expensive purchase spec, you know, cause it can obviously replace a softening point or a penetration with a DSR, but it's an expensive uh, alternative. But if there's some tests that can really show some performance aspects of microsurfacing that can give agencies the opportunity to use it, more and, and more confidently. I think um, using the low, temp, low temperature recovery residues in a DSR will kind of come to a lot of fruition in the near future if things can really get seen the performance. So I wanted to show the picture of the DSR just to show that, hey, that can be used and I think it, it is a future to be used. What I wanted to show you Next is, remember those that little film around the asphalt droplets that the polymer formed? And you can see a little, that little brown animated picture in it. This is an actual microsurfacing field sample from a highway near Waco, Texas. And Kuichi Takamura, many years ago, uh, uh, R&D person with uh, BASF, got this asphalt sample and he found a way to get the asphalt out of it. And you'll notice that in the top left picture, you'll see there's the aggregate and you'll see the polymer attached to some of the aggregate on it. And you'll see this little droplets and you can really see it in the picture to the right where it's a little bit concentrated on seeing how that polymer, just imagine the asphalt being in there. Well, what I correlate this to, I, I mentioned that microsurfacing is very good for rough filling and that's where it was first used. 
And uh, the picture on the right is a latex foam that say would be used on a mattress. And if you have a bad mattress, what happens to it as you lay on it for a number of years, you'll start sagging in the mattress and you get into bed, you'll roll in where you always are because you have like a little dent there. Well, that's very similar to how a road ruts. You know, you don't get that bounce back and you don't have the fatigue resistance. The better the mattress, the better the foam process. Um, now you have a lot of like memory foam type mattresses kind of out there, but microsurfacing is the same way. You get that texture and you, um, can really see that that's why microsurfacing does an extremely good job for rut filling. And as long as a road, the ruts aren't kind of continuously being formed, that basically the roads have kind of had rutted and you put in the microsurfacing, the microsurfacing will fill it in and do a great job of keeping that road good. So that's why I think these pictures really tell a lot on how the process works and why latex is so important in microsurfacing. The last few slides that I have, I really wanna get into um, kind of some of the mix aspects and just kind of show you how the polymer really performs in some of the mixtures. So we've shown you how it does in residual tests and uh, I really wanna get into how it does in some of the residual tests. And realistically, I know many of you heard of, have heard about balanced mix designs. Really though, slurries were the first true balanced mix designs. You had the loaded wheel test, the ISA TB109, TB147, that you to determine the top end of the emulsion content with sand adhesion. So that was very important. And with some of the microsurfacing applications, you now have the other TB that you measure vertical and lateral displacement. That just kind of shows that it has some of that fatigue resistance that you're looking for. This works extremely well to get kind of that top end of the emulsion content for these slurry microsurfacing mixes. So it does a very good job. And you can see the benefit of the polymers and especially in that vertical and lateral displacement parts of the loaded wheel test. And I wanna thank Ingevity. I, they were able to send me a picture of this. We don't have a loaded wheel test in the lab, but um, I really wanna appreciate and I thank Debbie at uh, Ingevity for getting me that picture. Next though, I wanna get into the wet track abrasion. This test originally way back many years, this has test been around for a long time, especially the one hour test, uh, which I wanna hit on a little bit of definition. The one hour test has been used in slurries for a long time. And you'll notice that unmodified versus modified, the green are the one hour tests. And you can see that with the uh, green bars, if you have unmodified, you had a pretty good grams per square foot loss on this, but with the SBR, you had a, about a 50% reduction in loss. Now, when polymer modified systems came about, and I really wanna emphasize this in the next slide, but to kind of show the benefits of the polymer, the one hour test basically was good, but the polymers were basically giving you extremely good results on that, and basically was lowering emulsion content a little bit lower. So people decided to do six day soak wet track abrasion tests. And the six day soak wet tracks, you'll notice on this that um, you have a pretty good, quite a bit of loss on an unmodified material, but with a polymer reduction, you had a 67% reduction in loss on a six day soak. So that did extremely well. And I, I would recommend that, you know, the design process in itself the six day soak and there's another test called the schultz Breuer uh, test that works very well to help determine kind of the, the uh, polymer effect in some of the microsurfacing mixes. But the six day soak wet track is very important part of the process. But I think I mentioned about the balanced mix design and how um, it's kind of, that was, this was kind of the original balanced mix design approach. But when I was doing a lot of uh, microsurfacing designs, folks would ask me, well, why is your emulsion content, your designs higher than maybe some of your competitors that are giving us designed emulsion contents? And the original idea, again, for this one hour um, wet track was to give you the asphalt content of an unmodified system. As you saw on the previous slide, the polymer modified system did very well. So what I had done is um, the green line on here uh, close to green, if you see it on the screen, is kind of the specification, which is 75 grams per square foot. 
one hour. And so what I did was I took different emulsion contents and of the unmodified emulsion, and I ran and got a slope. And so the first one that was below the 75 grams per square foot, I said, okay, that was 13%. And I said, that is what the emulsion content should be with this aggregate at the one hour soak. So then we modified it the way it needed to be modified to meet the residual requirements. And you could see that how much lower that was. And what I wanna get at here is if you're using the polymers, you have to be very careful for some of the tests that you let the polymer really do the work that it's intended to do. And you don't want to take out asphalt out of some of these microsurfacing systems and cause the polymer to help benefit your test because just like this graph, it will for sure benefit the one hour and six day soaks. But make sure that you have the right emulsion content in there for the microsurfacing mixes. And uh, there've been a couple of folks that have been looking at kind of whether we've leaned these microsurfacing mixes down a little bit too much in the past and trying to move up and kind of almost create a better balanced mix design. But like I said, um, I think the tests are available out there and you can see some of these things that are being used. And uh, the whole point is let the polymer like our butanol products do the work that they were intended to do and let the asphalt in there do the work it was intended to do. So you get the best lifetime extension for the users of the, of the road. And so that's what I wanted to show and kind of how I wanted to kind of end this um, presentation and just show you a few uh, other areas that you may get a little more information about emulsions themselves. You can go to AMA.org and the Asphalt Emulsion Manufacturing Association has a lot of information. ISSA.org obviously is a huge, great source for slurry and microsurfacing as well as chip seal applications. And the Asphalt Institute is an extremely good source for emulsion specifications for all the agencies out there. For those of you who have looked at that site, that's a wonderful site that gives you a lot of specifications and uh, things that I think would be really great for you to, to look at. So with that, I, I think a lot of my time has been used up and here's our my contact information as well as Bill Kirk's contact information. You saw his picture and uh, we're both pretty proud of our Charlotte Technical Center and Bill does a great job keeping up the lab. So um, Antonio, with that, uh, have there been any questions that have come in? Yeah, thank you, Arliss. That was fantastic and very comprehensive. Um, I am going to now turn to the question section. If, if the attendees, if you have any questions, I encourage you to put them into the question section and we'll, we'll kind of go through it. I have received one. Arliss, okay. uh, this is, is, the question is, do you see the low temperature recovery being uh, becoming specification in the future and how will that testing of the residue change? That's an extremely good question. I uh, Honestly, I would love to see a low temperature recovery method because um, as I mentioned, the reason I wanted to show a couple of those pictures in there, kind of that black cottage cheese looking residue, I've been on, probably literally hundreds of microsurfacing projects through my time and years. Um, and I've never seen a residue that looks like that. <laughs> I've never seen kind of this black cottage cheese looking material. And you can really identify that from the pictures I showed where Koichi had gotten that extracted asphalt out of that mix. And you can see that polymer structure that's there. That's not what's created when you do that high temperature recovery like a distillation. I think the low temperature recovery methods, which have been used in Europe for, for many years, um, to move to a, the DSR type testing, which is I think would be the best. As I mentioned, I, I would, you know, I think that would be a great way to go, but I think we have to show the industry themselves that we have a really good performance related test that show truly why these products perform. And I think that's where the low temperature recovery and um, I think the DSR can be used. We've been doing a lot and there's many people that have been doing research on it and 
looking into it. So uh, I think, yeah, I think there's a future to that. But I think, like I said, the negative part is it's an expensive test and a lot of emulsion plants may not have it. And to just swap, put a DSR in as a purchase spec that identifies something probably wouldn't be the best way to go. Uh, I think we really, if we can show the performance, a more performance related testing uh, to show exactly why these materials and how these materials perform, that's the way to go. Mm. Thank you for that. I got a comment here is not, not you mentioned that it's um, expensive, but also that low temperature recovery may take very long time to perform. Yeah, it, it does. Um, there, we've been trying to get it down to a, a reasonable time, say six hours. The European method, and really the method that works the best, is um, like the ASTM D seventy four ninety seven. If those want those, you want to look at it, and it does. It's a forty eight hour recovery. And uh, you know that's that's why that process takes a long time. It gives you a nice thick film, uh, and you know they're like I said, the data is out there that the moisture is pretty much out of the sample, and there's no issues with running those residual requirements. But uh, I agree with the comment about the time. Uh, there's process out there, but there's there's more issues with some of the thinner films now. But people are really looking at uh, trying to develop that a little bit further and uh, kind of get a better process to get that residue. But I think D7497, it's a proven method. Uh, it works well, it's been used over in Europe. And uh, you know, here everybody goes back to it when they do some other low temperature recovery method, that's the procedure to go back to. But one point I'd wanna make on that is people make the mistake when they get the residue off of that low temperature evaporation, they'll put it in a can or whatever, and then they'll heat it up to test it. And we don't want to do that. Um, you can make a little ball. That's why using the DSR, do a lower temperature recovery procedure. You could like uh, have a glove on, make a little ball so that you don't get oils from your hand on it or whatever. And then you can put the ball on the little plates of the DSR and test it from there. So you don't have to heat up the residue if you're you're doing it properly with a low temperature recovery procedure. But that's one of the things that I'd, I'd wanna make sure that folks uh, do not do. Great. I do have one more question. Um, if you have any other questions, you know, at the, after, after this one, please feel free to still um, send them over and we can get to those questions afterwards Arliss and Bill and I can can definitely respond with via email. Um, I have a question here Arliss, do you know some ambient humidity and temperature restrictions to uh, applying microsurfacing? Thinking about in different region like different regional consider uh, regional con conditions, what do we want to avoid? Yeah, I, I think the, the person who gave the question was very important to include humidity because um, usually uh, if you've got a, a fairly cool day, I would say people feel very comfortable with putting microsurfacing down at 10 degrees C or 50 degrees Fahrenheit and rising. I, I think that's a, a temperature that are, is fairly comfortable. One thing with microsurfacing is you don't want to have any freezing temperatures within 48 hours, that can create some problems. Uh, from a humidity wise, you have to balance that temperature that you have with humidity. So if you have say 10 degrees C and about 50% humidity, I think you're probably pretty good as long as the temperature is rising, if that's what it is in the morning. Uh, if you have a very, very kind of foggy, humid day, 85, 90% humidity, and, and it's very cool, um, it can be tough for a chemically, even a chemically reactive system like a microsurfacing to really perform well in those conditions. But you have to balance out and understand the system that you're putting down uh, with the temperatures. If it's working very well uh, in the temperatures and you can see that sometimes you can push that humidity level um, with those cool temperatures. So it's a balancing act there. I, I've always used, you know, if even a good microsurfacing system at 10 degrees C and 50% humidity should perform very well as long as, again, the, the temperature is kind of rising. 
but I've seen microsurfacing placed when it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit out on the road and as it was warming up that day because you know the inspectors and agency had seen it performing and they knew it was going to get warmer that day it may have hit like 65 that day even though it was a cool morning so they let them go um again the humidity probably wasn't going to be an issue that day so that's an extremely good question Wonderful. So again, if you have any last minute questions, please feel free to use the question box to send it over. If not, Arliss's um, information is attached and Bill's information is attached and we can always reach back out to you afterwards or send us a note directly. Arliss, with that, um, thank you so much. I'll give you the last word if you wanted to, to sum up. Um, thanks to everybody for attending. Yeah, just really quickly, I didn't mention our, our website on the bottom, www.basf.us backslash asphalt. And you can find more information on there, like the eco-efficiency studies and hopefully the videos, and there'll be a couple more videos in the future, right, Antonia? That, that is very good. Thank you. Yes, thanks for that preview already. <laughs> All right. I, I really want to thank everybody who's attended. And again, if there's any questions, like Antonia said, please uh, send me an email and, and I'll get to them. And uh, I really appreciate those who attended on the webinar. And again, Antonia, thanks for the introduction and handling the questions. And Ellie and Ann doing a great job with um, setting these up. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye now.